another week and another episode of the Obi Wan podcast made possible by Betwinner Chris and John back in situ in our lovely humble abode. And John, that contact book of yours, there's an awful lot of fellas still owing you favours because it's the big man this week, Petr Cech. Excited yes. for this. Yeah, the big man, the big man. Um, yeah, I can't wait. I mean, there's going to be a lot of. A lot of stories, a lot of uh, deep information that, you know, we have to get up from big man. So, you know, I'm, uh, I've got my fingers crossed for this one, you know. Uh, Pete, Pete is somebody who gets into into details and oh, I'm yes. sure he will he will definitely dive into a lot of details as what happened at Chelsea and also with Arsenal. I always find it and I'll be really interested to ask Petr this, but I know John Terry. We've had him on this podcast, his his personality, the leader, the, what is it? Captain, leader, legend. Mm -hmm. Frank sets the bar by his performances. Yeah. DDA we haven't had on the pod maybe one day, yeah. but you've talked a lot about what DDA brings. What the heck did Petr Cech bring to that dressing room? Well, he brought a lot. I mean, he brought the, he brought the calmness in the team. <clears throat> you always, obviously, you need a... You need a calm keeper when you, you know, when you're building a team. You need a keeper who's a shot stopper, who's good at stopping. You know, you, you know, who's good at what he does. You know, you know, you know, saving, saving the ball from going from the net, go, <laughs> going into the net. But then you also need a, a very calm and a short keeper, and that's what Pitt brought to the team. He was a keeper that never spoke as much, but I mean, the performances that he put on, you know, you know, he was able to bring to, to the table was something that, you know, we all appreciated. And, and um, yeah, very, very, um, uh, pop, uh, very, very, um, how do you say? He was always there. He's a keeper that was always there. He was always present. Exactly. Very accountable uh, with his performances. And he never lets us down. And uh, somebody that works really, really hard. Uh, and everything is achieved. Um, pff, truly, truly deserved. You and Pete ever come to blows? Nah. <laughs> I think we both have a, a, a sort of, a, a kind of, um, how do you say, personalities that, that never clashed with yeah, each you, other. You kind of compliment it. Yeah, we compliment each other because Pete was somebody that I can scream at, and scream, scream at, and he will look at it and, and be like, okay, you know what, well, you, you've got a point here. I don't need to go back and forth with you. And you saw somebody, somebody that when he tells me, come on, big girl, wake the fuck up. I know exactly what he's saying. So our, our, our personalities were, was so, we didn't have to clash with each other, but you know, we, of course we had few fights here and there, but which is what you oh, need when you have to win trophies. Oh yes. Well, listen, yeah. Petr is with us uh, and I've got a feeling that he's got an awful lot to say, yep. Petr Cech. So let's get to it now. Chelsea's, greatest goalkeeper of all time make no mistake about that 202 clean sheets in the Premier League 24 clean sheets in a season for goodness sake it's the one and only Petr Cech and Petr welcome to the Obi-Wan podcast made possible by Betwinner I'm in guys do you hear me do you hear me well I have a really good mic in front of me so you should hear me nice and clear oh my god <laughs> the most professional guy we've had in 12 episodes yeah. John I wanted to make sure that whatever I say, you can hear, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Love it already, Peter. How are you? How's the family? All good? Yes, all good, all good. Anyone who's watched the Premier League, for me, and I said this to John before we jumped on this, this interview tonight, Peter Schmeichel and Peter Cech, that, that for me is the top two the Premier League has ever seen. Very difficult to split the two of you. I mean, does that come naturally to hear that from from your your peers as well as fans? You know, it it makes you it makes you feel like you left your legacy, you achieved something, you left your mark. Because when you, you know, when you come to a, a new league and it, you know your dreams are to play professional football, the top team, winning top trophies, and I was obviously fortunate that I ended up in the top team for uh, two top teams in England for for 15 years and every year fighting uh, fighting for Champions League fighting for trophies and you know the the achievement comes a little bit later all the time you know when you are playing you go day to day game by game yeah. and you, and said said reality is no matter how good you were on Saturday you start from zero on Tuesday. 
Exactly. And there is a, <laughs> and, and that's the sad reality. You cannot, you know, people who get carried away and literally goes, I was brilliant on Saturday, and then go yep, Tuesday. Yep, thinking, oh, yep. I don't have to work hard. Yep. They usually then get, you know, you, you get actually this, this professional sport slaps you straight on your face, you know, right quickly. <laughs> so, you know, the consistency is actually the, the, the one of the hardest thing. And then when you achieve that and you get on with it, you know, while I was playing, I never thought about it. I was breaking records and I was happy. And that was what motivated me, give me confidence, give me pleasure. But then there's always when you retire, you know, you retire. That's actually yeah. the first time when you can look back and actually think about the games and think about the amount of trophies you won, the amount yeah. of games you played, what level you played. It it just naturally sinks in after a couple yeah. of years where you just go, oh, you know what, looking back to this, it was actually great. It was actually <laughs> good. And this is, not, you, know, you know, when I look back now, you know, you just gone and and my aim was, okay, finish the game, got a clean sheet, great. Prepare for the next game, try to get the clean sheet. We get the clean sheet, great. We didn't get the clean sheet, you go like, Anna, come on, we need to get one next next game. Yeah. And you just get on with it and and you pile them up and obviously everybody around needs to help you. It's not only only one one person job, yeah, but, true. Yeah. but uh, you know, if everybody does it, then you get to a certain number and you think like, you know, and, and you go like, oh, great, can we add one more? Can we add one more? When I got to 150, I'm thinking, oh, can I be the first one to get to 200? And I'm thinking, well, come on, try to get wow. to 200. <laughs> wow. And then, and then uh, you know, and then you just go, you get on, and you think like, well, and the closer you get, you think, yeah, exactly, well, because it, because it, obviously there was a record there for you to break, wasn't it? Uh, 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 um, what David James was yeah. was there, and you knew you you you, you could see it, it was in your reach. And you knew you could get to that and, and break it and be there, you know. So for you, did that play in your, were you thinking about that as well? You know, for me, the clean sheet is a tool to win a game. You get the yeah. clean sheet. Like, you know, the, the first season when I came to Chelsea, we had 11 clean sheets. Oh, oh no, sorry. We we had 24 clean sheets, but we won 11 games, 1-0. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. So take, take those games, you know, take those points away. You don't win a league. Probably. True. So True. it's actually the importance of that is not the clean sheet itself. It's actually the tool to give you the trophy in the end of the season. That's yeah. what counts in the end. And this is where I was saying, like, we get a clean sheet, you get one goal. And, you know, we, we uh, at, at one point when we were going through this um, time uh, where we got over 1,000 minutes uh, invincible in terms of goal conceded, yeah. you, just, you just go get on in it. And and you don't really think about conceding a goal. You just get you just get on the pitch and you feel like oh we scored and you just go well we got three points. Yeah. <laughs> because you, no, you get this you get this feeling like you know we will never concede because yeah, yeah. everybody gets the habit and I think I, and I have to say, obviously it comes within the group. Yeah. So it came from Jose from the structure from he, him saying I do, I want to be this team. Hard to beat, awful to play. You know, we're yeah. gonna defend well. We're gonna play well when we can. We win <laughs> games where we are not playing well, but we everybody needs to contribute. And yeah. I think we, as a team, we bought into it, and we actually knew that we have so much quality that if we if we build this platform of defending well, not conceding, you actually are free to play football after. Peter, I'm sure, like your close friends, family, know who you are, your character. Uh, I think I speak and I consider myself a bit of a football anorak. I must admit, Petr, I don't really know the personality. Who is Petr Cech? We've had John Terry on this show. I kind of knew who John was. I've seen Frank, I had an idea of Frank. Tell me and tell our viewers and listeners, Petr Cech, what makes you tick? What were you like in the dressing room? If JT's hammering people, what were you doing in the dressing room? Listen, uh, we were fortunate that we had all these personalities in the dressing room and we were all different, yeah? And so you have JT was, as the captain, he was the obvious one. He was the one who, when he felt something and he wanted to be loud and tell people, <laughs> he would make sure that <laughs> he did it. Yeah, yeah but in a, in, a, in a good way, yeah? Then then you have... In a uh, good way and a bad way as well. <laughs> both ways. Like, actually, both ways, you know? You yeah, grabs you in the fucking neck. Sometimes, 
you know, but I mean in a good way, you, it doesn't yeah. matter how many swear words you use, it's just exactly. the purpose of how you do it and when you do it. Yeah. Right? But then then you had someone like Frank who, yeah. who, who didn't speak as much, but he leads kind of by example in terms of his work ethic. Yeah. You know, he comes in, does his job. When you see him doing everything, you just you just get inspired by that, or you just see and you think, okay, this guy's serious. I can rely on him when he's on the pitch. And don't get me wrong, he, you know, we say he was the quieter one, but when he had something to say, he would say it. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. Another, yeah. It's another thing. Yeah. Then you have someone like Didier, who is a who is the obvious extrovert one <laughs> where everything goes out, you know, that you can see it on the pitch, off the pitch, the frustration, the happiness, you know, you see everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm the kind ego of man. Like, yeah, it's this guy, he's like, but, you know, but you can see it's the guy who scores the goals, works hard, you know, yeah. he cares. And so that's, you know, it's different, but, but it's there. So you, you put this together you have already a really great, like a good puzzle of uh, people yeah. kind of dealing with the dressing room. And, and I actually understood my role very well. If I play well, I'm the one that everybody relies on. Yeah. Yeah. That's my aim. But then I know that these guys take care of the things. But at the same time, as I became a, an important part of the team, yeah. you know, when I really feel there is something to add and something to say, I say it, mm, yeah, and mm. and and to be honest, I'm the quiet one. But when when the when my anger spills, I can get <laughs> <Yeah>. angry. <laughs> could, could he get, but, could he no, get that's it? true. That's true. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very quiet in a way that I let people get on the job. When I see that they care of the things, I just yeah. go quietly along. That you know, I'm happy they do it, and then you know, some talk to them, but. But when it gets to the point when I get angry, I actually get angry. Come, come on, then. <laughs> no, I've seen him. I've seen him. I need to know yeah. when has Peter been really angry? I've seen him. I've seen. I've, I've seen. Obviously, like you said, it's rare to see Pete get angry, though. But um, mostly, when I've seen, I've seen him do it, it's on the training pitch. Really? You know, one time he had it with with Flora Maluda. <laughs> If he remembers that, Flo was obviously Flo was Flo, and then he said to Flo, "Oi." If you know, don't want to train, you can go home. <laughs> that's true. That's true you remember that one? <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, for example, I, I like the, the the one part was when we were training. We were lucky. I think we were lucky that most of the times we we managed the training that the the, the standard of training was insane. Yeah. It has yeah. to be yeah. high. And, yeah. And I uh, and, and actually, I have to say, we had uh, we had um, we had one of the managers. And we had quite few. So one of them came and I think it was Carlo. And he came um in the first training session or a couple of first couple of training sessions. He he said to me, he said, My God, you know, everybody wants to show they are ready. You know, the intensity, <laughs> the 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 tackles, the runs, the everything is in there. It's like whew, this is like a match. <laughs> and, I told, and I actually told him, I said, I said, you know, boss, I actually think that this was one of the Worst tra training <laughs> session in terms of that, because I just felt like everybody looked tired and not really like. And, and then, and then he couldn't believe it because he said, "Well, no, you know, we we do, you know, we did this different way, you know, different countries, different teams, different league, yeah. Yeah. different different attitude, different training, and then uh, and then you had that, and we we actually really, I think the the success came from that, because the training was like a game." Yeah, and, and I mean, if you have to fight in training, you there, or if you have to fight in a game, you fight in training. And then yeah. we had fight. Like, listen, we had fights. There were yeah. plenty of, there were oh, plenty. plenty of entertaining uh, yeah, fights plenty. during the training session. <laughs> but then you know it it spills over. There's a fight. Uh, you know, people get you know everything yeah. cools down. Yeah, people get straight to say, okay, what's what's the matter? And then then you move on. And I think that was the that was the key because because sometimes you know it, it was a borderline. You yeah. know, JT al once almost broke my like uh, leg <laughs> in a, in a five a side game because we, <laughs> they were lo they were losing, and then he got he got up and he wanted to show everybody that they should press and don't. And I yeah. get the 
and he like two feet, two two <laughs> foot tackled, and he literally ran me over. And I had to, I had to, I had to walk in. Is one of the one of the only sessions I had to literally walk in because I had no a, way. <laughs> Yeah, I had I like a bum on that my. Day, yeah. I had a bum on my shin. I couldn't like I couldn't walk like uh, literally. But <laughs> but it's not do, do it made on purpose. I just mean there was this level of uh, competition and this level of like boom, like you know you get to do your job. And there were people yeah. who show more to others. Where you know you you need to you know stick with it to yeah to make the team and to actually make everybody successful. And you know we. We now laugh about this because you know we ex- I exaggerate a little bit, yeah. But yeah. I just want to show that there was this level of respect, yeah. But the level of big competition too, and I have to say, my my training sessions, I went hundred miles an hour every day. Like my yeah. my yeah. purpose is always okay. I go in and I do hundred percent. I want to get better every day, and I hated when the training session was not was not good enough oh, yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. this is yeah. what i got yeah this is what actually made me kind of angry when when i saw you know you have a five a side game and i'm running right left making save after save and people people walk around and smile i just go yeah. like you know guys <laughs> yeah. i like i put the bin in there and then like and i walk in <laughs> because, like if you want to do that do that yeah but then yeah. then you put people back on track and they go like okay fine let's let's uh, i've got to say Peter, the yeah, intensity yeah. with which i'm listening to Peter, i can no. see i would not mess with this man so it kind of lends itself to the next question because you and i john have spoken about this with jt with frank yeah. with josie the modern footballer Peter. you know jt said it Footballers today don't train like we did. No. Frank said you've got to manage a group. Jesus Christ, Josie said to us he'd be in jail if he managed you guys. Exactly. You it know, just, if it, he managed it, like yeah, he did. It just tells. I mean, it's not like, you know, we've all been here and we've, we've all said the same thing and Pete is here now saying the same. You know, it's just that the that, that, that intensity of, yeah. the, of the training. And he just said, JT almost, almost broke his legs. <laughs> Because he was losing in the five side. But that's JT. If he's losing in anything, it doesn't matter what it is. Whether you're playing a fucking dart with this guy, darts, yeah. board game, in the fucking dressing room after training. He wants to win. He wants to win because he's probably put 20 quid or 40 quid in it. <laughs> but he just wants to win. And then in a five side game, if he's losing, because he's not, he knows the manager is looking at him yeah. thinking, oh, your team is shit. But he knows he will play in the weekend, though. But still, he wants to win. to win. He wants to win, and that's just the attitude we had. Everybody needed to 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 work to perform in training because your spots yeah is on the line. Yeah. And so on that, then Peter. I mean, when you look at football today, you might struggle because I, I see it's it's the game is different today than what it was some fifteen years ago. Well, I think you have to look at. How how the 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 new generation is, how they are brought up, and how big advantage they have over us in terms of having the facilities. You have the GPS. Everybody gives you right load yeah. that you don't go like we had to. Like when I when I started playing even professional football in uh, 1998 when I signed, you know, 99 started playing the preseason. You didn't have the GPS unit, and you 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 had the you had the heart rate monitor, and everybody ran the same amount. So imagine you have a guy who is an absolute runner, and then we had to keep as a group, and and you just go. So some people they didn't really work hard, but some some people came in the dressing room and they were completely knackered. But so you just go, you know, the you, the load everybody puts on you have to deal with it. Find your way, manage manage what you need to. What you need to do, go through it as well. I have to say that is a two different things uh, today. Is obviously we talk about the mental health of the of the players. It is important because if you're not fit, obviously that it can decrease your level of motivation, concentration, yeah. like uh, joy for the game, your performance. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But you cannot go to one extreme to another. So before, when I played, when we played football, I think that was the extreme of. The winners never cry. They never have a problem, never have a personal issue. If they have an issue, they just follow it. You get on and you run through the wall with your head and you get on with it. Yeah. yeah. So in a particular way, 
it's not the best way to do that is one extreme. But we were brought up like that. So basically, we all knew that no matter how bad the situation is, that you can you have to somehow, you know, put the thick skin and try to try yeah. to deal yeah. with that. So yeah. I think you learn a lot with it. I don't think it's the right way to do it because then a lot of lot of people who would with a little bit of help, who had a lot of quality and could actually be successful, they just burn in there because it was too much for them. But but today I feel that we become a little bit the opposite direction. Like everything is too too much to you know to to protect everybody from any yeah. stress, yeah. from any failure, from any like you have to fail to get better. Sometimes you need to Definitely. hear that you failed to get better. Yes. Yeah. So it's not like you laid on people and murder them, but you have to realize that okay, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You are failing. You need to find your way to get better. So it's not the it's not so I think the right balance is actually the best way to to get on with it. And and obviously that would be what I like to see. But I have to say sometimes uh, you have now p- uh, players who have their own staff, own fitness coach, own skill yeah. coach. Yeah. Yeah. And then you and then they tell them something else, then you are told at the club, and then yeah. sometimes Sometimes what you see, and is actually probably the biggest danger, is that uh, you know you have a player now you have the precise load to make sure that everybody performs, and then you see people in the gym and they go like half-hearted because then they have their own session at home with somebody else. So then yes. you just go, yes, okay. Then we used, to, I used to do that, but I would go hundred miles an hour in a training session. Yeah. And then if I had to do something extra, I would do 100 miles an hour in that other session yeah. and try to and try to make sure that, for example, if my goalkeeper coach knows about it, that, it, that I don't come the next day and he doesn't make me do the same thing because it's yeah. completely yeah. fire. So the communication is important. You've said there, and I find it fascinating, the, the, the rules that apply to some 15 years ago, you had to get on the train or you, you weren't making it at Chelsea. You know, you've also alluded to the fact there, uh, maybe managing them in a differently, different way, being a bit softer could have actually helped them be a success. So on that basis, which player stands out to you, Petter, when you look back with all who you played with, perhaps the tough love didn't work, but if you had your time again, you would have loved to have seen whether they could have gone on and been a success had they been managed a little bit differently. It's... it's um. Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to say because we had so many you know we had so many talented players coming in in the club every year. Some of them were in the age where they were mid uh, mid twenties, so they obviously had all this experience and they just get them you know came in and yeah, and it was like easier to get them into because they they were in a different stage of the career and they were actually playing all the time. So when you bring a young player to a top club, I think this is where the biggest challenge is. Yeah, because the the young player needs to needs to be playing, but sometimes you know when you have a squad full of internationals and top players, you know you will not get as many games, and then this is what where 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 is the balance? You know, where, you know how much is beneficial when you stay in a top group yeah. and yeah. train and play not enough, or if you go on loan and show everybody that okay, I get I get my yeah. you know games and then I come back and. So it depends on the philosophy of how you take it. But I think most of the times for a young player, you come with full of, like, you come full of dreams. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, John came to the club when he was 19 or even less, you know, you were 18, what, yeah. 18, 18 yeah. 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 So he come from uh, from Norway, you know, there was this <laughs> epic, bu- epic, <laughs> epic battle of uh, Man United, Chelsea. <laughs> So everybody suddenly knew who you know who is that guy coming from uh, from Norway, and, and then he walks in. Everybody goes like, "Okay, now show us what you get." Because yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> and this is and this is actually where you have to sort of go like, "Okay, let's see what is this kid made exactly, of." Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Because he yeah. comes over here, and we all know that this club was fighting with Man United, and he exactly. ended up on the real limit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in terms of uh, how he ended up with us, yeah. so you just go, come on, show us what show you show us that, show <laughs> us. <laughs> and and I have to say, that's not a really you know, simple position. And this no, is what's not. happening now. The young yeah. players like that coming to a top club, 
with a huge price tag. Yeah. So everybody goes, okay, show me what you got. But for exactly. a young player, where you are 18, you are, you know, you have always passengers and you have always drivers in the team. When you're 18, yeah. you are, you're not the driver, you're the passenger. Yeah. Exactly. And then, yeah. And you yeah. and you learn your way. Somebody learns faster and becomes the driver faster. Some people course, never become the driver at all. Of course. They, like they yeah, 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 yeah. Like we always said. Yeah. Yeah. It took yeah. It took me a while to 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 you know like you said you know like Peter is saying I I came in of course I have to okay show us this kid okay they're fighting for you uh, my United yeah. and Chelsea okay now show us why we've why we've paid. We paid Lino slow. We paid Manchester 12 million. We paid Lino slow 4 million. Yeah. And you didn't kick a ball for, for, for Manchester United. So show us then. Because we've been, they, they used to winning the, the, you know, the trophies and all that. And for me, it took me a while because obviously I'm a young kid coming from Africa. You're coming from Norway. Uh, via you know, via, you know uh, of course. And then, you know, I come in and I see all these, you know, guys, these giants of guys and giants of egos and giants of, names so for me i use uh, automatically my head went boom did it yeah that was my that's when i think back you're it, humble though. john you were hum you went about yeah. your work i think i i was I, I was too humble i was too humble i because my head went boom because i saw these guys i was watching them every week and week and my head went boom and I, once my head went down because of so much respect that yeah. I have for them, which I should, but then I should then continue with what I, but I went straight down and my head went down and I just couldn't be able to live up to that expectation. And then it took me a while because obviously Makalele was there as well, Essien was there, yeah. and these are the guys that can play my position. And then of course, Jose said, okay, listen, you have to learn from this guy, yeah. Makalele, because he's gonna live in six months. And then after that, you can be able, you can start to play a little bit. So for me, I was happy that I got a little bit of time to also establish myself. And um, and and for me, that's amazing. And coming back to what Pete said previously, with inform, do you think at this time though? I really th do think that kids, young players, are given way too much information. I listened to Carl Angelotti the other day speak. He said. He feels like football nowadays is spoiled because yeah. coaches are giving players, young kids, way too much information. And also, uh, as, as the one for Argentina that won the oh, one. Oh, Lionel Scaloni. Sc Scaloni. He said, Do you think if every coach told Lionel Messi when he was coming up to yeah. pass the ball, do you think we would have had Lionel Messi? So for me, I think that's way too much information given to the kids now growing up. I think, you know, when you, when you, uh, when you, when I got back to the you know drivers passengers, you have you have people who become drivers because they they learn how to how to manage the situation. And when you're too early, too young, and you didn't you've never been in that position, somebody pays 70, 80 millions now for you. You come to a club and everybody expect you to be the driver. Yeah, okay, yeah. now you you now we pay so much. Now you show us what you get, and you you could see it from from. Uh, John's experience is is not easy because it's you not. you as as soon as you don't start playing and you you take your time you feel like you're failing everybody and the expectations yep. and and it yep. makes you nervous so that's why some people actually trust struggles to come to a big club because you have to realize okay you you come with a big price tag that's your help yep. because you might get more opportunities but it doesn't take away your responsibility to to learn to play to train you know to make sure that you yeah. do the right things instead mm. of thinking too much about the pressure so you have you actually you know you you have to you you have to sort of like let it sing and do it when you come like when you're 18 19 of course you will everybody wants you to be tactically aware but i agree with you yeah. that you know how many hours of your day when you were a kid growing up how many hours of your day after school was playing football at the, in the club and football outside with your friends. Because I I literally, I went to school. After school, I went to my football practice. And, and then I came home. And then I went to play basketball, tennis, football, like ball hockey, wh whatever we were like. Everybody, I lived in a block of apartments. So we were like 30, 40 kids, the group of us. And every day there were, there were some games being played outside. And and you have six year old playing with 
18 years old. Yeah. And they don't ask you whether you're ready to compete. You know, they that on the on the street, they don't ask, you know, nobody no, asks. They don't. You. No, they I don't. went I went in go, I went in goal because I always like like when I went in goal like to, for the ball hockey, the guys shot as hard as they could. You know, it hits you everywhere and you go home think and then you just think, but nobody asks, like, you wanna be in goal in this game. Yeah, 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 yeah. We nobody we don't asks. look at the age, we don't look no, at the no. like fight fight your way through. So you do it. And then and then I think today, today, because everybody plays football from age of four, five, six, and and people tend to drill them, you know, you you don't really know. I think it will take longer for me to um to tell the sports I played growing up than those I didn't play. Wow. And, and all this hand-eye yeah. coordination, all these experiences of figuring out how to play different sport in different ways, different conditions, I think it prepared me when I played football. I had a huge, and I worked hard for it as well, but I had a huge hand-eye coordination. I had a good understanding, the reading the games. I could adapt to different situations. And I think I learned it because I was brought up playing other sports. Yeah. You should, you should, you should let people figure it out yeah. to a certain degree. You give them basic information that they understand the rules and the concept of the game, and let them express then, themselves. Yeah, but let them yeah. express themselves. Let them play. And I think I have to come back to this because that's that was Arsene Wenger. So when I came to when when I came to Arsenal, this is actually the Arsenal way, the Arsenal philosophy is that you give, obviously, the structure to the team, but you make sure that the players who are in your team, they can express to, 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 to their best ability the football you want to play. Right. And that was, that was the big thing on Arsene, that he always, he always believed that when you scout a player and the player comes with the qualities he has, he brought him for that qualities, and so he wanted him to play that on the pitch. Yeah, right. not, not not to then tell them, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, right. you can't do right. all that. So he had a completely different way of looking at it when when we talked about football. And of course, you had tactics, you know. Otherwise, you don't win a Premier League game. If yeah, you don't no, of course not. People don't play together. You can't win a Premier League game. But he always made sure that there is a balance between tactics and people expressing their football. And to be honest, sometimes when we when we get caught in games where everything flows with Chelsea we had that as well we had so many talented players when you get the game and it gets going and you just go are oh, we gonna trash these people five six yeah, seven yeah, because, yeah. because like they have no chance and people took a pleasure of of doing it not only defending but doing everything and that's just that's on that Peter and, and I think that that's an interesting port of call you, you've worked under two managers who let's be frank did not see eye to eye Jose loved to get under the skin of Arsene. Two, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but from the outside, two very different characters. I, I won't reveal who, but a former footballer who played under Arsene and Sir Alex Ferguson, he said the biggest difference, it blew him away, was that Arsene did not spend any attention on the opposition. And he actually said it was probably to his detriment, as successful as Arson was. Can for, for our viewers and our listeners, compare the two and be honest with us, Peter, for your personality, who did you enjoy playing under more? It you know, they are different in terms of the approach and the character, but I have to say they have one like a clear similarity. They they are both bad losers, they hate losing. <laughs> And I can tell you, there is no difference between uh, <laughs> between Jose and Arsene in terms of losing the game. He doesn't obviously. Jose express it different way, <laughs> yeah, completely different way, and he makes sure that everybody knows. <laughs> like the moment he comes the next day, he's making sure that everybody knows. But yep. you you can tell that that Arsene does everything not like he wants to win badly as well. But he has his own ways to to, to do that. So this is very, they, are, they were really similar. So although from outside you think it's not true, it actually is true. They all do. And in terms of the opposition thing, you know, everybody evolves and the game evolves and I think it needs more. When I was at Arsenal, we had a proper opposition, you know, uh, like uh, reports Scouts. and tactics yeah, and yeah. everything. Like we prepared. Not not probably to too much of a detail of what they're going to do. But it was about okay. This is how they play. This is what they do, and this is how we want to express our game to to make sure that we win. So it was not um, 
about you know you sit there in different space and you do know you play your game but you have to be aware that this the opposition team plays yeah. certain way so we had we had this meeting like when i when i was there obviously you know during the career and football evolves and everything evolves it changes we you know the, the meetings we had at the beginning ch changed as well over the over the course of the years because you get more data you get more information sometimes maybe too much maybe you focus too much uh, over it but i'm one of those people who rather knows more than less obviously we've done our our you know we've done our duties in training we've put in the hard work we've put in everything we had to put in and for us, we already know the mentality is there, of course. Our mentality never changed. It doesn't matter what we do. Going into that pitch, we have we always have same mentality to go in there and kill and win the game. For us, that's it never it never changed. So having way too much meeting on that, for me, just something that I never really enjoyed, but I had yeah. to do it. But the mentality of us winning and going out there and killing the open end for us never changed. Yeah, and, and Jose said that to us, Petter, that he would be pissed off. If you weren't 2-0 up at half time at the bridge, he, he'd be angry. No, you know, I think uh, I think Jose was very uh, strong in terms of making sure the message comes through in the right way in the half time. And actually, he once almost killed the whole dressing room. Everything was flying. I think it was 4-0, actually. Wow. <laughs> And I, I remember that because he walked in and but he he did it sometimes the other way around. You know, we had one game at home. I don't remember who, who it was, and it was absolute awful half. Like literally, we couldn't get anything going. And everybody tried, but you know, we were completely disjointed. There was no flow, slow, the 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 miss passes, the wrong shots, <laughs> wrong choices. <laughs> And they obviously, I, I, I don't, I think it might have been West Ham, and and they were like, you know, they got the, uh, they they got the good feeling that you know this this might actually work. So yeah, you could there's see something. Every yeah. minute they were growing, and you just go, oh my god. <laughs> so we we were walking in the dressing room, and uh, so I walked, and 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 I think actually, I think it might have been uh, Makelele walking with me, and I told him, I said, oh my god, you, I can see everything flying. <laughs> <laughs> because he was so bad and he walks and you know and he walked in and he goes like well i like this you know it's nothing's going but we're still in the game <laughs> and i was then thinking, I was thinking like, My God, like what happened to him you know so he sort of put it, like everybody in the place of okay it's this is absolutely rubbish but don't panic yes but then that game for nil we walk in and you could feel like everything was going everybody was laughing and then People started doing yeah. like little little tricks, entertain the crowd. Yeah, and this is where I think he realized that if we do that second half, yep, and they you score, can get sloppy, and they score, everything will change, and it'll be a long half for no reason. And I think this is where he just run in and murdered the whole dressing room in the, like <laughs> in the exceptional, <laughs> like everything was flying, like the table, everything, whatever was on the table was going, bottles of water and chewing gum. <laughs> Everything was going, and he was completely mad. And everybody goes like, "Oh, hold on a minute! He he didn't like that we dropped. <laughs> he didn't like that we dropped actually the level of concentration. The level, yeah, and yeah. He started yeah. making silly things and mistakes. So he he would he would not allow that. He he didn't like it, and that's why sometimes he would play with your mind to put you uh, to put you under pressure to know that you know. But at the same time, it's what, all about mind games, isn't it? We, we but Jose, at the same yeah, time, the sometimes games. he was, you know, sometimes he was straight. Like, you know, when when I when I came, I think when you came to Premier League, they changed to 18 players to the game. So you had yeah. you had eleven plus seven on the yeah. on the on the bench. But when I came to Premier League, it was only 16. So can you imagine you have a team of 23 internationals and then you can have 16 people for the game? So there was literally a second goalkeeper plus four. Yeah, so when we played at home, this is what, you know, we had, we used to have meetings where he would come in and he said, uh, he said, okay, Makelela, we play a team where we need to dominate and attack. I don't need a holding midfielder. Sorry, you're not playing. I don't need you even on the bench. We are playing at home. We play to win. And this, we need to play. We need to play. I don't need you there. Ooh. So he said, you have a weekend yeah. off. 
it's not yeah. your fault. It's just because tactically I need to I need to play, and then what? Why you know? And I only have four people on the bench. Yeah. Then it's, yeah. If, if we are losing, I want I want this player in. If a, if a defender gets injured, I need Robert Hoof in or whoever was in the you yeah. know in that in that squad. So he says I need you in because they they are big and they are strong. And for the last five minutes, if they just kicking lo- like a long balls, I need you in. Yeah. He said, "Sorry, yeah. guys, it makes two spots." And now then you have seven people waiting for the spots. And uh, and I remember he pointed. I think it was actually Joe Cole with the uh, <laughs> with um, I don't know whether it was Wayne Bridge or, or someone. And he just goes, and you two, you were so bad last game, you don't deserve it. And then they were out, you know. And then, but then it keeps everybody on the toes because you go like, hold on a minute, you know. They, so we we sort of had this uh, understanding of why sixteen people go to the game and what we're gonna do and and what he wanted to do. And it's true that every home game, it was we don't if we if we um, if we are drawing, we don't want to draw. We we want to win. Yeah. So basically, every single yeah. home game, no matter no matter what, he would put three at the back, extra attacking player, and you just play 10, 10, 15, 20 minutes to win a game rather than drawing the game. Because he said, "Well, draw at home is like a loss. Who cares? Like you, you, you know, we have to. We 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 did it like that." And and he did it with Porto. Yeah. He did it. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. everywhere. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't lose nine years at home. No, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. with. <laughs> With everybody, but I think was genuinely the the attitude towards it because everybody yeah. knew, don't worry about the draw. It's not about getting the point. It's about finding the winner. Yeah. And of course, you come to the big game, important game. Nothing is going. You are one one nil nil, and you know, okay, we're not gonna win this because we are not good. So then he would say, okay, fine. If you can't win it, just take the draw. In this case, just take the draw. But he would never ask you like to play. 80 minutes for the draw. He would he would tell you last 10 minutes. He would say, "Okay, you know what? Take the draw. We are not yeah, good yeah, today. We yeah. can't win." And we had uh, obviously courtesy of playing with uh, under so many great managers, different managers, different approach, different mentalities, different different coaching skills, and and I think it was it was kind of fascinating to see how everybody was different, but we always managed to to, to get win. the best yeah, out of yeah. the. Always managed to get out of the group, which means that there there was something in that group. It has always been my driving force. Growing up, I dreamt of playing for the Nigerian national team. My passion led me there. The support and unity of players and Nigerian fans led us to the final. Together, we won the African Cup of Nations. The moments that will forever be carved in my heart. Join the winning team with Bet Winner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to ask a deeply personal question here, Peter, and I spoke to John about this before we started this podcast. It's a date, I think you know where I'm going with this. October 14th, 2006 the Majeski Stadium. It's probably the question, and I should probably apologise, Petra, it's the question you probably get more than any other, but I want to turn it around if I can uh, and ask a, a really personal question, and, and, and perhaps you don't even have the answer for me, but did you change after that incident? Did, did your outlook change? Did you as a individual, as a footballer, uh, as, as a human being, did that night change you at all? No, I think it changed me in the way that I realized that it can end every second. That, you know, you have this, your dream of winning trophies, playing football, and this is what you want to do, and you work all your life for it. And you actually realize that in one second, in one incident, one tackle, everything could have ended. And I think it just opened my, it opened my mind to, to prepare for the, for eventual, you know, possibility that I will never return. And really? then obviously when I, when I returned, then I was like, Oof, I, I dodged one bullet, I'm in, I'm back, and I do what I love, and then g- gave the opportunity to carry on. But that was the first moment when I started a couple of weeks, first f- month, when I was recovering, I had days where I felt like this is never going to work. You know, there were days really? I was completely, wow. 
like thinking, oh, no, no way I'm going to ever play football like that. But then you have good days and then you just go, you know what, let's keep, let's keep going. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And then, uh, then obviously I got back. But it, in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, you never know. It can be another challenge, another, another bet, if, like coincidence on the pitch. And then you end up with ACL and then you are back where you were. And I'm like, yeah. And and as well, even when I when I return, I couldn't I would not I wouldn't know if I actually sustained that. Because you know, you could have a level of anxiety, different like health issues. You never know yeah. because the obviously it's relentless every day, the pressure, the games, the, the you know, so you you don't you never know how your brain's gonna work. You know, maybe your leg is a leg, you know, so you just think it's it's gonna yeah. hold or not, but your brain you never know. So even in that moment when I re- like went back, I was like, okay, I have to think if in three months I realize I can't do that what? because either, either I'm not thinking as fast as I was, I, I suddenly feel like I can't play that game or if the my body just doesn't you know, accept it, you, you never knew. I set my mind on, on doing everything possible in the best possible way to get back playing. That was my aim. But then then... I was like, okay, what if is not good enough? Yeah. And then what if the um, I will not be able to because my you know coordination or whatever the brain will not manage, and then it, it could easily happen. So I was like, okay, I need to make sure that I'm ready to do everything I can, but I have a plan B and plan C in in a way that if I if I never return, what I'm gonna do, what I wanna do. And then I return. So basically the best thing happened. I yeah. return, everything was fine. But then I carry on on trying to make sure that I study, that I have a plan B, that I prepare early enough to have my coaching budgets. If anything goes wrong and I have to stop that, I'm always like step Covered. ahead. So it yeah, it right. changed me. Right. right. This is how it changed me. The n- not right. the preparation, not really the the relentless of of uh, training and games. I went exactly the same, but I always felt like okay. But one thing I would say, I was really obsessed with it, like with preparation, training, being everything like spot on. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then that I, I realized, and then I realized that you know what, maybe maybe in bad day, I had bad days when I was recovering, and then I realized maybe some people actually sometimes feel and have a bad day. So I can't really be too too almost like pushing them too much yeah. because what if what if it's not it's not because the player doesn't really try, but it's so then I started having this difference of, yeah, maybe it doesn't feel right. So you just go, okay, are you okay? You know, are you fine? And oh, fine, okay, fine. But then if you find, then come on, <laughs> you, have <to> do <laughs> than, you have to do better than this. So yeah, but yeah, but this is this is what what changed that you sometimes realize, okay, we were not good enough, we lost, fine, accept it, and then get on and prepare next day and go again. So I I kind of dealt with failures bit uh, bit easier that I didn't dwell on them too far too much. Clear, clear something up. Uh, I always remember and I always felt this was unfair. You know, whenever anyone criticised Petr Cech, there was always this kind of uh, I guess narrative push that the, the helmet, the the headgear that you then wore yeah. after the injury that it was seen as almost a safety blanket. Did Petter really need it? I always remember reading comments, he needs to get rid of the helmet. I want the old Petter back. I mean, put that one to bed. Was that on the doctor's orders or was it seen by yourself as something that would put you in the position where you felt confident to be back on the football pitch? Well, if you have your skull shattered in 80 pieces and then you have uh, metal plates in there, <laughs> Then obviously at any moment, you know, if you get a big knock, it can break again. And mm. I'm like, okay, do you really want to play a football where you know that the impact might break it again? And then, or you have a severe concussion where you never recover. Like, uh, you know, I had, I had two concussions playing with the helmet. So it explains it. Can you imagine in that moment? So two. I was out for, yeah, two concussions playing with the helmet. And then obviously you take those one week, 10 days, whatever it was before you get back and you you are fine. But imagine if I didn't have the helmet at that instance, how big blow probably would have been for the... Because because that, that helmet takes like 80% of the impact you get. The impact, yeah. So, it's a, so that's why I, I worry to make sure that if I get hit, nothing breaks again and that I don't have a severe concussion because then after that you're prone to have a concussion. So it's not really, you know... 
if you if you think about that, yeah, you you always want to play without it because you hear better, you feel better, you see better, you feel yeah, the space, <laughs> yeah. you and and as well, you know, look, I have no more hair playing in the helmet all the time. <laughs> I don't know. I might have not have it anyway, but I blame the helmet for it. But um, no, but the point is that it's far more comfortable if you don't have it. Yeah, so I, you know, so when I now, when I play the, um, when I, sometimes I, I I think like, okay, should I play without it? Should I play without it? And then I play the, you know, the, we play the, the Ukraine game, then we play the other the Legends game for, for Luca Viali, and then you just go, okay, should I go with or without? And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to now, everybody who is uh, 50 kilo heavier than before, I don't want anybody <laughs> to land, accidentally land on me. And then, um, and and then you know get uh, get me back to the hospital for no you know I I don't want to do that so yeah so obviously there is a there is a medical reason behind it otherwise I wouldn't have worn. But you you still felt you were the same goalkeeper, Peter. You know that this notion that you lost part of your let's call it I don't know superhero powers. You still felt after that injury you were still the Peter Check of old as a goalkeeper. Well, I, I well, mean. If you, if you look at the, the the stats and and the amount of uh, clean sheets and and the amount of uh, trophies we won after I I got injured, then uh, you know you don't you don't have to really argue about it. I yeah, think, yeah. I, and I actually felt in a in in a way you know it gives you a like a different perspective. Then it gives you a precision of looking after yourself as well a little bit more because. Um, because it gives you, you know, it, it, it as I said, it shows you that uh, you know your body is your instrument for your work. So you you mm -hmm. better look after your tools better. And I, and since then, I actually looked after myself better as well. Because prior to my head injury, I played sixteen months with broken shoulders, what? and then I had both broken shoulders. Played two almost season and a half with it. Played the World Cup with it. Then I had the surgery. Then and then I when I came back, actually, what happened was then I then we played we played Reading and then I was back out. But before that, I you know if somebody tells you you have a broken shoulder, you just go okay, fine, I, I get on with it. And and then <laughs> then you just go. That's crazy. After a while, after a while, you know, I had pain this, that you know yeah. when I when I caught a cross or a dive like a long shot, yeah. I would have tears in my eyes because it was so painful. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, yeah, mate, but then I was like, you know what? Okay, get on with it. I want to win the next game. I want to play the World Cup and, and I can actually perform. That's what get I want to say. Mate, I felt, that's, mate, that's what it is, I, isn't it? I, like, I, he's, I felt, he's just explaining this yeah. right now because obviously, you remember, obviously, we, you know, he's playing with broken shoulder. You remember, I just I said John it earlier, Terry broken John toes. Terry playing with broken toes. You know, we have to take injections. But then you remember, we have to, you know... Before game, the doctor's office is busy because <laughs> everybody's going in there. <laughs> one is getting injection in the back because the back is not functioning. One is getting injection in the toe. One is getting injection in the knee. We all have to take something to. We we we. There was there was really no excuse because number one, if you don't perform, if you don't play, you don't, somebody comes yeah. in, plays better. We win. You out of the you out of the fucking team. Before you get in, you have to pray that we lose again. And that takes my fucking Months. a month or so. So you out of the team. So everybody wanted to be wow. in the team. So that's how much we wanted to be on the team. So I mean, that just shows it shows that, that that's what we saying. It's not. It's just what it is. But right now, today, somebody has a scratch. Oh, I'm off. I'm off for two weeks, three weeks. I can't play. Oh, and it, it it's crazy. It's crazy, but. I mean, I'm not just saying it because of that. It's just how much the game has changed. And I keep saying it though, the tradition of the game, I, I, I hope we don't lose it. We have to keep the tradition of the game, which is, you know, fighting and fighting. The, 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 the. But we don't have that anymore. Football has changed. I think I have to accept or we have to accept it that. It has. It is, no, lot of it things. Has, it has evolved, for better, and we have to live you know. with it. We have to live with it. Better things. Like lot of better. things. A lot of things change for better. A lot of things we can argue all the time, but uh, but it's true that what modern games have is a huge advantage of now in terms of training preparation load. You can have everything you need, but still, if you don't put the work, if you don't yeah. have the right mentality, and then if you don't do it yourself, your inner engine doesn't take you there. You will not, you know, you will not use it to the full potential, and I think that's that's what uh, everybody, whoever 
managed to be successful, you always had to have someone to support you. But the biggest part of the job was made by you. You know, I yeah. I have to say, I've never been told, oh, come on, get go and do a little bit more. No, I was never told. I was always Oops. told, come on, stop. <laughs> you need to get dinner and then <laughs> stop running around, stop kicking the ball, stop playing with the racket, so stop shooting the basketball. Come, you know, it's time <laughs> to go home. It's time to have some some rest. And, and that was it. But with the injuries, you always have a choice, of course. Yeah. The, the priority, obviously, it depends what you put a priority. I always put the priority on performance. So if I go in and I can perform to help the team win, no matter what I have, I go in. Huh. If I felt like, well, okay, now I'm injured, but if I go in and I'm actu I actually can't perform... That would be stupid. I've done it once. I have to. I have to admit, I've done it once in my in my career, and it was um, in in Premier League. It was against Aston Villa. We played at home. Aston Villa at home. We drew four four. I think the last minute they had a penalty. Ashley Cole saved the ball uh, on the goal line with the hand. I think last minute we were we were two nil two nil down or two one two one down. Then we were four three up, and then they scored. Um, I think Guard Barry probably I think was the one who scored that goal, and it was four four. But I I turned my um, like the, the 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 muscle like um, I think was the oblique one of the one of the abdominal muscles, and I and I just couldn't. I think I. It was from the game we played. We played at Blackburn, and I, I bumped into Santa Cruz, and and it went. Yeah, and I couldn't. I couldn't move. And then because you know I was used to play with all sort of things, I said to the doc, I said, you know what, I think I can do this. Like, you know, that's fine. So I got some. I got some painkillers in there, or some local anesthetic, whatever it was. And I went to the warm up, and I felt, you know what, it's actually not uh, not too bad. But then when yeah. I started playing the when I started playing the game, you know, it's sort of the, the 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 side went numb. And then I suddenly realized I can't con like I had a really yeah. weird control over my like movement to you know like it almost feels like you're you're um penguin. You no, you yeah, it almost <laughs> feels like your bottom side is kind of floating, you know. And then I was thinking like, <laughs> oh no, this is not a good um this is actually not a good, uh, <laughs> not, not a good feeling. Eh? And then there yeah. was a, like a really bad shot. It's like a literally little shot in the middle with the bounce. And I went to scoop it. And you know, as I lost the control of my, uh, you know, of the pelvis, I sort of like swung a little bit, and then I, <laughs> then the ball went off and went in. No, and, yeah, it went in like that. And I'm thinking, oh god, this is not a good idea. <laughs> but then at the halftime, I thought I will have to get off the pitch but then i'm thinking you know how stupid you would look and then you would go and say well actually and i said well i decided to do it now you eat your crumb until the end yeah <laughs> then I, and then i carried on and then i that, then i had these regrets when i went home i'm thinking four four never considered <laughs> but it was because that was stupid i have to admire this that like i have to admit not admire i have to admit that that was one of those games where it was stupid to go. Oh, right? yeah. But I played with worse things, so I thought, well, I'll be fine. Yeah. But then, unfortunately, that 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 one, did one, uh, this this one didn't didn't pay off. But this is where you have the choice. But yeah. I would always say, you have to make sure you have to perform. So we won back to back titles. We won a title back to back titles. I had broken shoulders. Like that's crazy. Shoulders. That is wow, crazy. that's crazy. And that's then crazy. I went to the World Cup and then I could perform. You know, so there was nothing wrong with my performance. It was just that it was a terrible pain every minute I played. But that was what yeah. it was. Can, can I ask better? You know, John and I spoke about this as well. The the evolution of the position that you play in. You know, goalkeepers now, I, I'm a, I've said this on the pod, so I can say yeah. it again. I'm a, I'm a Man United fan. Huge fan of David De Gea. Huge fan of David De Gea. I know, listen, I was at Good. the FA Cup Good goalkeeper. final. Good goalkeeper. A phenomenal shot Great stopper. Uh, developed in the Premier League. He was, you know, quite slight when he came. Yeah. I was at the FA Cup final last season. He cannot play out from the back. I think I counted 12 times he gave the ball away. Not a, a ball-playing goalkeeper. 
But my God, as a short stopper, incredible. I prefer to have a short, short stopper than a, player, than a player. Than a keeper who can play the ball. Uh, Andre Onana comes in. Exactly. Stats don't look great in terms of his shot versus save conversion. Yeah. yeah. But we're told that he is fantastic with the ball at his feet. When you look at the evolution of the position, Peter, I'll ask you straight. If you were coming through now, would, would you be in vogue or would you be a David De Gea type? And what do you make of the evolution of the position? First, what I want to say is that if you play with purpose from, from the back, you have the build up, there's nothing wrong with it because everybody is on board. The players are on board. They give you options. When you look, when you look at Man City, when you look at uh, Bayern, when you look at Barcelona with um, yeah, but, yeah, but with, Pete, with it, Pep Guardiola, yeah, you see they played from the back, but at every every opportunity you stop the game with the goalkeeper. When the goalkeeper have the ball of, of at their feet, yeah. they have options. Because yeah. the whole team allows that. It's like a big rondo inside of the of, of an area, either left side, right side, middle, box, wh whatever it is. And I think that facilitates the, the game. Once you have players who don't really uh, participate in that build-up, then you put more and more pressure on people with the ball. And I think when you play with purpose, and the purpose is you create yourself opportunity to turn game forward and you go and you attack, I'm completely fine with it. What I, I don't like, what what I don't like about it is that you see so many teams start playing them from the back, thirty passes and sixteen heart attacks later, <laughs> they they end up at the same spot where they yeah. started. For yeah. like you see, there is no there is no second phase. There's not really like playing. So I'm fine if you play with it. We played like with when I am Mary like that. I loved it. Like everybody said, oh he doesn't like that. I I loved it because I had so much ball. And I could play, but I knew I can rely on people around me because we were all, you know, we were all practicing it and we were all, okay, this is what we do. And as well, we had the clear, um, we had the, like a clear setup of, okay, if you can't play short, you go long. It's not, there is nothing wrong with that. So it was very good the way it was. And I really enjoyed it. And, but you usually play with the, with the, with the purpose. And, and then if you, you know, like uh, Jose always said, well, like you kick the ball 90 yards, you have Drogba who holds the ball against any defender in the world, and in two and a half seconds you are in a position box, why would you make 35 passes sometimes? Today, the danger of Man City is that you have a goalkeeper who is brilliant of playing short, and he has a 90-yard kick. Because you go to press and he kicks it behind you, and if you don't go to press, they play. So that's beautiful. But what I wanted to say, if you remember the year when Claudio Bravo was number one? Yes. Yeah. He was absolutely like Claudio Bravo. You can watch every day, every minute of every game playing with the ball. It's amazing. He's like he's like a player. He's like a proper player. Yeah. The technique, the understanding, the movement, the way he controls the ball, and under pressure, it's amazing. But he had a year where the ball was avoiding him in terms of the saves. Yeah. You know, they played some games. I think Everton had five shots, four goals. Then they played at home, three shots, two goals. And and that was where they they didn't win games. I don't say it was because of him, but I was saying that, that they were missing important saves in important times. Yeah, yeah And exactly, it was a yeah. problem. If you look at the Champions League final, Man City won. And I think that was the game where Ederson actually had some difficulties of passing. He un, unlike, Unlikely, usually... Yeah, he made some bad decisions with the ball. He made some yeah. bad passes, and yeah. sometimes he wants so he had to save himself to kicking it in the in the touch line. But then he makes four important saves, and they won a game. So exactly. I, what I want to say is that the saves, the goalkeeper should be there to give you that important save in the important time above everything. And Joe Nana, I think he's a fantastic goalkeeper. But of course, when you the Premier League is always difficult, isn't it? it? Especially when it comes to keepers, goalkeepers as well. You need a bit of time to to settle, to understand the game, because everything comes quick. Everything is it's fast. What it is. We've seen like Man United struggling at the at the at the time, so it doesn't obviously help any. any it doesn't any help him. Yeah, come yeah. In, any yeah. new player coming in, if you if you find yourself in the in the team who who keeps you know he who is kind of. Uh, 
that is kind of finding itself even, you know. So yeah. they, they have good games, they have bad games, like they are not consistent. So you can you can see that it's not it's not easy for the the new goalkeeper coming yeah. and filling the yeah. boots of of a goalkeeper who was there and be, was outstanding was player of the season many times so if you you have to you have to realize that is not an is only it's not an easy job coming after like it took man united a lot of time to replace schmeichel yeah, then, then obviously before you know and they had top, they had top goalkeepers in the meantime you have tim howard you have bartes you have like you name them and Bosnic. it was not yeah, and it was not, you know, it, they didn't find it easy. And then obviously Edwin came, and then you know it it was brilliant for them again. So you you have to, you know, you have to realize it's not easy to fill the, you know, the boots no, of not. some yeah. any yeah, player who is super super uh, um, successful in any club in any position is not easy when and when no, you are yeah. the one who comes, you know, you have a you have a tough job. So and that, so they, in that in that case, I I believe the the um, the team has to has to help you and when you go back to the the style you know when you look those who are really standing out in terms of goalkeeping and and you know adjusting to the like more and more playing you you find obviously Ederson you find Allison you still you have Courtois you have um, uh, you have obviously Neuer still you know you yes, have, still. You know, a lot of people forget but you know, he's he's still uh, you know making like Bayern really realize on him <laughs> yeah. because Absolutely. he makes those yeah. those important saves and he, he he does what he what they need him to do. So you know, you you always I don't want to forget anyone again because he's there's always, a lot of good goalkeepers. Yeah, yeah that's right a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a lot. It's always a lot. Uh, you know that. But then you have the you know then then you come back like the the situation Ramsdale Raya at Arsenal is really interesting in in that way. Because when you when you look at the both, uh, uh, you know, if, if when you look at this, there is um, uh, is a competition where the both goalkeepers are pretty much one like Strange. another. Strange, yeah. Uh, so then you just go, pounds. and then you go, yeah. So it's obviously the coach's decision all the time. But you find sometimes things like that where obviously it depends what what you want from the player to play. And in the top clubs, uh, unfortunately, you always again. That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. That comes that that comes that comes to the next question you were going to ask. I mean, I mean, when it comes to that situation, because uh, I mean, of course, I played with you for so many years. But one thing we never we never got into was. When it comes to the weekends or when it comes to game, I know you, you, you guys, you have your, 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 your train on the side. And then, of, of course, when we have to play like the five aside or a game, whatever, then you guys come and join us because you, but you are there doing your thing. When it comes to the weekend or obviously the game there, who makes the decision? Because I never got, we never got into, I never, me personally, I never got into that. Who do you, who makes that decision? Was it because obviously you spent all that hours and days yeah. training with, your goalkeeper's coach. And is it just because, okay, Peter is number one. It doesn't matter how much, how well he trained or how bad he trained. He will be the number, number one. one. Or the manager says, okay, I want to change. Or the goalkeeper coach says, no, 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 no. Peter is number one. He yeah. stays in goal. So who makes that it's, decision? It's how does that decision no, it's, work? It's very, it's very indig individual with the coach. Yeah, so you have, I played under, under all, so all different coaches. And actually, they were some of some of the coaches. They were like, "I make the decision about who plays. That's wow. my decision." Okay. I look, I look around, I look in the team practice, and I make, I look how people play, and I make decision about it. Then you have uh, coaches who come and you said, "Okay, I make decision about who plays," but the goalie coach gives me recommendation. Right, so basically, right. the goalie coach comes and he said, "Listen, I think that could be the plan for the next two weeks. I want this one play here, that one play there, or I want him to play both games, or whatever. Whatever suggestion there is, they come and say, "Well, I've seen them train. I've seen this. I've seen that. I would like uh, the goalkeepers to do this and that." And then the coach says, "Okay, I go with you," or he says, "No, I go with my decision." Yeah, and then you have uh, then you have the code um, then you have the coaches who just go. I don't understand goalkeepers. You are always on the side. So whatever goalkeeper coach tells me, I take. So if he tells right. me this one's playing, I'm putting him in, and that's it. And then that's what we had. Uh, 
like for example when Unai came uh, to um, to uh, to Arsenal with Javi's um, this goalkeeper coach yeah Javi came to me and 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 Bernd and he said okay guys just want to let you know that I'm making suggestion and I I tell what I see what I think but then Unai makes his decision about who's playing and that's that's how it's gonna work so you can come to speak to me but then in the main decision is obviously the coach so you you do it like that then with Christoph was the same Christoph would prepare a plan he would he would go to the coach and said listen this is my plan my proposition i would do it like that if you like it you take it and if the coach said no i don't and it happened once because when um, when tibo came we played sporting lisbon in the champions league and then um, and then um, christoph came to me and he said well are you you playing so get pre- prepare you playing so i go <laughs> go start preparing preparing and then we go to the we go to the last bit of the practice where you have these tactics and Timo yeah. goes and he goes. <laughs> and I went to Christoph. I said, Christoph, you told me you told me I I I am playing. And he said, oh, I'm I'm really sorry. I forgot to tell you. Jose Jose said, well, he doesn't want to change much because it's the beginning of the season. So he keeps the he keeps as it was for the next game, which was like a change of plan. Yeah, and if he, go, he forgot uh. to tell me, so I'm standing there <laughs> thinking, like, just a, come, on, "Come on, man, you know me for so long, and you forget to t- you forget to tell me something like that." But it just shows. So you know, Jose, so Jose decided to change at the last minute. He, no, he just he just went with the lineup. He wanted to keep it. So the yeah, plan, yeah. they had the plan. But after wow. the weekend, after the weekend, he just go because the game was on Tuesday, I think. So we play Saturday, Tuesday. So then after the weekend, he sort of said, well, I, I didn't like the, 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 the team. I want them to play the same, like, same team to play again. And then therefore, then he didn't change it. Like he said, okay, the, you know, I, I know we, we sort of spoke about it, but that was it. But it can happen. And, and, yeah. I absolutely, and I actually get it. And I think that should be like when you go to, to any, any situation where you know exactly how, the, how it works, then it's fine. You know, you you know your coach makes the decision. You know, uh, you know how it uh, how it is. So we we know whether it's goalkeeper coach or whether it's the other guy. But I think the important part in like the the, the micro work of goalkeepers is that I I was always lucky that I had brilliant teammates. Yeah, because you know you know it. You ask any player, and then you are training, and then you get told, okay, you know that. So, you know, you know, as John, you sit there and like you're yard, yard, yard and a half uh, away from him. He can tell you, you just go home thinking, inflated, <laughs> angry, upset, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, and then you, then you imagine you, you sit on the bench and you know, you can go after five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, half time. If somebody gets injured, if nobody gets injured, you can go minute 60. If there is, you can go three minutes, whatever you get 20 yeah. minutes or something. But when you're in goal, you generally sit on that bench and you go, oh, like, yeah, okay, yeah. okay yeah. so yeah. if he doesn't get injured, we play well, he plays well, you keep sitting on the bench. Yeah. And you keep yeah. training. And you have to be training. You have to be preparing every day yeah. because otherwise it can backfire quickly. So you get to be ready for your opportunity. But then you go and you know you will not get 20 minutes or you will not get even half an hour. The game is 4 nil half time. Yeah. You know, three three younger players go in. You put some people to rest. <laughs> everybody gets their share. Everybody is happy. Yeah, not not the goalkeeper. It doesn't work no. like that. So yeah. this is the this is the hard part. So you need to make sure that your group actually makes it enjoyable. That you push each other. You work hard, but you make it sort of like enjoyable. That you know the people who are not playing, they don't feel wasted or they don't feel not motivated and so we were always lucky because we had a always great group when we pushed each other and we had a mutual respect and of course you know i don't you know the the guys didn't love me too much because they were not playing much but uh, <laughs> but, anyway, was, but they they respected it and they you know then they they probably you know felt like okay you keep winning and you keep getting clean sheets fine you know get you know you win so that's yeah that's yeah, sometimes yeah. how it works but is the is the hard part and i like them um, i like them um, you know uh, actually the arsen once said uh, he said you know being a coach is the strangest thing in the world because 
you hire people on Monday and you fire 10 on on Saturday, on Friday afternoon and they don't <laughs> go to the game. It's like you get hired and then fired on, on Friday. You don't wow. go to the game. You don't make the team. Wow. And then and then you go and then you come back on Monday and the coach comes, oh, sorry about the sucking. I, mean, <laughs> you, I need you. You know, now you're back. Come on. Come on. Come training again. So that's that's how it like, you know, that's how it is being a coach yeah. sometimes because you have that's to make crazy. difficult decision and and how you how you make people motivated and happy that's that's the biggest task it has always been my driving force growing up i dreamt of playing for the nigerian national team my passion led me there the support and unity of players and nigerian fans led us to the final together we won the african cup of nations the moments that will forever be carved in my heart. Join the winning team with Betwinner. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious of time here, Petter, but it would be remiss of us not to, to ask about this because there'll be a lot of Chelsea fans, there'll be a lot of football fans, and certainly people who have followed your career closely. You know, John and I spoke about it. You're a jack of all trades, you're a master of all trades. You know, you did acting. I know that you love your ice hockey that you're obviously playing now. He speaks, I think, four or five languages. How many languages, Peter? Yeah, yeah, a couple, yeah. Couple. <laughs> Five, More yeah. than a couple. Uh, we know that, of course, you got your MBA. One of the intriguing aspects uh, and a chapter in your career is the technical advisor role that you had at Chelsea. Yeah. You were you were playing a critical role in shaping the future of that football club. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that role, your relationship with Roman, and, and how much you enjoyed it. I I um I love the part of working with people. And being being uh, involved in the training ground, working with the manager, working with the scouting department, working with the data analysis department, working with everybody. You have academy and scouting department, and and loan department, and then you have obviously the first team and and all the people working in there. I I, I love that. I loved working with everybody to make sure that we are on one page, that we actually the football side goes the direction we all one wanted to go and and obviously be the the sort of like a co connection point for for the board because obviously yeah. then then the board obviously they they have a bigger picture you know they yeah. look after whole club they need to make sure the finances sits well they need to know they know the vision and the and the strategy of the club is fulfilled and of course you have financial fair plays and you have a lot of um a lot of things you you don't really consider when you are on the pitch. You don't really, you know, care too much. But, but then you have to you have to consider all these things. And and obviously, when you can sort of connect it to the football matters, the best possible way, and making sure that everything works in unison together to the same goal, that's that's very um, satisfying. And I have to say, I really enjoyed that part. And I and 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 I mean, like when we won the Champions League in uh, in Porto. That was probably the most satisfying moment of my career. Really? Like, because, because you see the amount of people that are truly happy and work for it. And you have you have people in the training ground who are Man City fans, United fans, Spurs <laughs> fans, and you Arsenal fans, but they are genuinely happy because they are part of it. When you yeah. make to feel them part of it, and then you right. have the fans and million. Like everybody who contributes is a huge amount of people, which as a player, you you know, it's fans and you <laughs> and the team. <laughs> and, you, and you just go, well, brilliant. But then when you realize how much work goes behind the scenes, the people who are the kind of the unsung heroes nobody speaks about, you just go, you know, they are truly happy. All these people are happy. So the team make all these people happy. We contributed. So we are happy for everybody. It's actually was really unique uh, Kind of experience, like a completely different way. But that was what I what I liked. What I do, what I didn't like is obviously the demand, the time demand. You know, yeah. you're 24 seven, constantly on your phone. You leave your emails, literally without any 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 break. And sometimes you have days where, you know, you you said you you know you wait 
you work in the training ground, come home thinking, okay, quiet day, and then everything goes crazy in 11 <laughs> p.m. And and I have to say, you work with the different people and and different agents and different. Um, but sometimes uh, this is the, the hardest part of it because when you see when you see when you see people talking about football and they you know the the agent is selling you a, a, a player and and portrayed it as Lionel Messi and you know there's only one Messi <laughs> you just sometimes feel like oh come on people you know just <laughs> but but they you know try. at the same come on they yeah, got to try you know, <laughs> but you know at the same time of course i was a player as well and i wanted my agent to get as most for of for course me. yeah yeah so yeah. i understand so i get both sides so i can understand i think was the advantage that you know what the player wants and you know what the the club needs they are of course difficult moments as well because um, you know, if you look at, uh, if you look, obviously we, we we changed the manager, and then when you know when Frank came, I was I was really happy because uh, <laughs> you know, teammates, I was thinking, you know what, this is gonna be yeah yeah special, yeah yeah special for everybody we, yeah, exactly to have, <laughs> to have a le- like a legendary player coming as a coach, you know, and then everybody was super excited, happy, and then you know it, it ended prematurely. So you just go, you know, that these are the moments you don't really. Yeah, look forward, you yeah. never look forward to, but but as I said, the, the you know you have people at the club who have to, you know, make sure that uh, whatever is set in the vision and the strategy of the club is yeah. Yeah. it's kept the way the the club needs, and and then obviously yeah. put, then then the board and they have to make decisions. Sometimes are not popular, but they you know it happens yeah, like yeah. that. You have to do it. So, so come on, Petra. This is where you can take a bit of credit. Thomas Tuchel, this is where you tell us that you were the man in that boardroom saying, we need to hire Thomas Tuchel. He's the man that's going to deliver a Champions League for us. No, I don't want to, I don't want to take credit where, you know, where there was a teamwork. You know, we had, we had actually the, the people, you know, we had the, the working group, which obviously always discuss the, the players, the, the managers, when we discuss players, it was always was always obviously me, then Marina as as my boss and, and the representative of the club, and obviously very important one, the most important one, because you, <laughs> even you get the money or you don't get the money. That's, you know, if you don't get the money, you don't get you don't get the player. Can yeah. you do it? Can't you do it? So that was the thing. But it was always the manager as well. So we would we had this agreement that the manager that the player would never arrive. If one of us don't agree on either club didn't agree or either the either the manager didn't agree. Because you don't want to bring a player the manager does not want. Because that's that's obviously not what you want to do. So you need to because then if the if the player comes and the manager that never wanted him, then will he play him? Or you will be forcing the people yeah. to play. Yeah, yeah. It's wrong. It's not it's not the right thing for the, the even for the the work of the manager is already difficult enough to do that yeah so mm. then you don't want to you don't want to put even more more uh, like a complication on him of course so, so that was always the it was always the the case which we tried to we tried to honor and then i think it worked very well with with the with the with both managers we had and obviously then when when i left a uh, lot of people there were a lot of changes we know there was a lot of changes so then then however the, the system works now i i don't know and but uh but we try to always make sure that we are in in agreement for players, the strategy, the team, that everybody can kind of build on it and that the success on the pitch continues. Okay, can I just ask this? <laughs> yeah. And again, we're going to wrap up soon, Peter, but I'd love to know, and I think Chelsea fans would as well, obviously the, the new owners come in. Did, did you have a conversation? Be, I mean, be honest with us, Peter. Would you have stayed or, or did you feel that your time in that conversation with Todd and, and the rest of that new ownership group was the decision made that it was time to move on? Or had there been a role for you, would you have stayed? No, I have to say the, the decision to leave was mine. Yeah, so so I had very good, you know, pe- people think that, um, that, you know, that you ownership come and then I didn't like and then I left. No, I I have to say that I had very good conversations always with Todd or Bedard because they are both working on it. It's not only Todd, like there's a lot of times uh, it, we always hear oh, Todd Bolly, this Todd, but no, it, they, they work together. So it's, yeah, it's Bedard, yeah. Bedard and, and, and Todd and I had uh, conversations with them because it's not, um, it's not they came and I left. 
no, we we finished that. You know, that the the transition came from almost three months before the end of the season or two months. So, so obviously there was a preparation for next season. But I just, you know, I, I, I just, I just felt that there is a. Um, was it like a loyalty thing, kind of? You think you felt? Not because because you 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 know when I when I uh, when I do things like. I do them 100% and 100 miles an hour. Like if really invest in there and I do everything. But at the same time, we we did something. You have new owners. They came with a lot of uh, ideas and they they had their vision. So this is what they prepared, the, the vision and everything, which, uh, you know, which which is normal. And I, I almost felt like, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you come to a new club and you bring the new club, you should do it with people, you know, you have like hundred percent, same vision, same thing. And, and, uh, and, and you go forward. And, and that, that is the thing that, that, um, I was, I was thinking, you know, I think will be, it will be actually, um, the best for everybody. If, if the club starts from, because the transition was huge. So if you just go, okay, let's, let's give them the, the, you know, the line start from there and, the, and start from zero yeah yeah and and that that was i felt i felt was the best uh, the best way not to not to sort of always go look past oh we've done this you want to do this or no i didn't want to go even into that like uh and and it never happened because because i i you know i live in the in the time where we didn't have to have conversation about i would do you would do are you yeah. want i don't we didn't even get there and then that, that's probably the best way to uh, you know to uh, to do it so i i just felt like that it was my decision which i which i gave uh, which i gave to the club and and then obviously they they respected my decision and, and that was it you're still a fan you still watch them yeah i watch of course it's it's you know you, you always watch clubs where you spend uh, 15 like i spent 11 years you know i watch all my all my clubs i i i went through i i watch same as like i watch chelsea I watch Arsenal whether they manage to make that last step last year. I thought they they gonna make it. Then it's it went last second. So you just go, you know. I, I'm always I always watch because uh, because you have the connection to the people, you have the connection to the fans, you have the connection. So you you want them to be happy. So you hope that um, they will they will get what they what they want. And and of course uh, you know the. The success of this club uh, is undeniable in the last uh, 20 years. So, you know, when you when you set the bar so high, you know, you, you sometimes it's hard to keep it that high. No, no doubt. Right. Yeah. I, I want to ask one last one for me, yeah, yeah. John. You might have a couple as well. Peter, one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time, and I, and I mean that sincerely. I'm not just saying that to butter you up. So, you're allowed to build a back four. The back four that you would have loved to have played behind, build that dream back four for me if you can. Who's your right back? It's impossible. Oh, come on, Peter. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's actually impossible because when you go through already when you go through the defenders, like central defenders is impossible. Is like uh, you know who who you put uh, like do you choose. Uh, Ivanovic over Aspilicueta or Ferreira? I don't know. Like, how do you how do you measure it? <laughs> like, I, 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 thought almost, you were I, I thought you were going to say Cafu no, or maybe it's Lillian it's Turan. It's, it's, like, you can, well, if you take the, like, I always build, when I do this, I always build a team from the people I I didn't play with because all, all the ones are not the, the obvious one I play with because because from the teammates is almost impossible. Okay. So, so <laughs> I think so you is trying to, I think he's trying to be very diplomatic here. Come on, Pet, this is not disrespectful. This is just the four that you look and went, we're going to keep a clean sheet today. Yeah. If if you if you talk about clean sheet, okay, I put um I put um Ivanovic. Yep. I put JT. Yep. I put <laughs> Carvalho, I think I yes. put I put Who? I put Carvalho. Yes. And then uh, then Ashley, I think, yeah. 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 That would be that would be probably the the, yeah. the lineup. If you talk I missed purely one, about though. I missed one. I missed one. If you yeah. talk purely about that, of course you can put Galas as well. You know, who you yeah. put uh, yeah. who, who do you who do you choose? Like Galas, Galas, the advantage with Galas is that he is the size and he can play on the left and he can play in the middle as well. Yeah. 
but then you go like you, you know then you then you kind of feel like but i had but i had galas on the right my yeah. what what i thought you will say is galas jt cavallo and ashley you know eva was very is it is the is the one who is like a like a angry dog who you would, ne <laughs> you would never you would never ever want to play against no he's yeah. big yeah big, he's big strong, strong yeah and and he jumps into everything and talks yeah. to you at the same time and when he oh. gets upset when he gets upset he's in your oh face my God. like you don't I, i don't i don't think you like playing against people no, like that no i think sometimes so he just gets angry for nothing <laughs> He just gets angry well, for nothing. Well, we, like, we walk in the, we get in the, we get in the, we get in the, in the, in the dressing room, and then, like in the second half or whatever. And then he just goes, <laughs> he just kicks off. He's going crazy. He's just going crazy. But <laughs> you, can, you can find the. Like, what is going on? Okay, just calm down a bit. Like, just calm down a bit. Calm down, take a breath. Doesn't make any sense though. At the end of the day, it doesn't make any sense though. That's the problem. That's the problem. Be He said it, and that's, that, that makes completely sense. <laughs> yeah, it makes complete sense. <laughs> no, no, but but you can find I think on the YouTube you can find there is a short video where like last minute of one of the games I I, I shouted at him to to leave the ball for me, yeah. and I put my face in. He almost kicked my you know he almost put <laughs> kicked my face off. <laughs> And I went to I said, Eva, what are you doing? And then he then he completely so we were yelling at each other there. I was holding the ball, yelling at each other there for, for about 30 <laughs> seconds. It was literally right at the end of the half. Then I had to kick it because I was actually surprised then the then the referee didn't didn't blow the whistle for me holding it too, <laughs> too long. But we were literally arguing for no, for nothing there. So he was quite lovely a, guy though. Lovely guy. Find, you yeah, say yeah. That. No, 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 he's a lovely guy. No, no but he's a, a lovely guy. Yeah. He's one of those you you like to play with. Yes, I'm telling you. He's like one of those guys you yes. want on your team. Huh? Yes, but then when he goes, that that's the part we don't understand though. The lovely guys, one of the guys you want on your team. He wants to fight for the bars. He wants to fight yeah, for he the does. team. But then when he just goes on with that crazy rant and stuff, we absolutely do not understand why. <laughs> what is the just, reason? Just leave him. To yeah, you. just leave him. Just leave him to it. But amazing. Yeah, amazing guy. Amazing guy. Amazing. But, better. But it's the same, you know. If you take if you take Didier, it's not easy to play with Didier for everybody because he's constantly expressing his feeling, and then if he doesn't get the ball, he goes, you know, you see, he's not happy. He's like, yeah. yeah. But but when you when you get to know him. You know, you don't look at that on the pitch. You you know that when you need him, he will be there and he scored that goal. You need to to lift the trophy, and that's it. You just you just know he's emotional because he really cares and he's really he really wants to do it. And you you have to realize you have 25 you know players in the team and everybody's different. Like everybody has his own things and express their way different ways. So you need to really be good at understanding who is who. And that's that's why even me when I was you know t telling people what I wanted from them on the pitch, I knew there were people I could yell at because they would need it, and then there were people who I had to be more like, come on, don't worry, just you know get get on with it. Like because I knew that if I in the moment where they sort of felt upset that they made a mistake, if you yell at them, they, then you will not help, and you know it. So it's it's important in the communication and and with Eva actually. First thing we were walking on the page, he goes like, "You have to tell me all the time, all the time. You have to tell me." And I'm thinking, Eva, you can see yourself. There's a player." So I was constantly yelling at him, and that was what he needed. And I think that's the role of the goalkeeper. Sometimes yeah. is you see things the others don't. Yeah. And I have to say that the greatest uh, help I had was that people sort of accepted that I see things they don't, and and allow me to. Tell them, you know, it's not a nice thing when I yell at you and you say, come on, go there, three meters, come on, and more, one meter more and come back and go. And you think like, come on, I'm close enough, but I didn't like it. So I was yelling like, no, go closer. It's not the nicest thing sometimes because you are like in the, in the, in the, in the pain in the, in the backside sometimes. But but this is how you make the clean sheets. This is how you yeah. you do it. And I have to admit, I I. I I probably haven't seen 20% of the goals we scored live in the games. Because <laughs> I was looking at the people at the back where they are standing. You know when you have a cross coming in? Yeah? So you have a cross coming in and you just go, okay, cross comes in. If we don't win it, they win it. Where are my people? Where yes. are they standing? And I'm like, 
before like the cross goes in and I'm yelling at the right back, come in. I'm yelling at the people on the other side to tuck in or to push to get the second ball. And in that moment, boom, Drogba scores. And I'm like, okay, who scored? <laughs> like, you, go, you go like, okay. The, the, the obvious one is then you see him, you know, going like that. You go, okay, yeah. you know. But sometimes you see a pile of players and you just go, you know, there is a big uh, melee in, in front of the goal and somebody taps it in and you just go, okay, who scored? So, half, like most of the times, I, I actually was so focused on organizing everything that I, I missed goals. And so I knew we scored, but I didn't know who. Like, then you just go, okay, then you look at the, at the <laughs> screen and you say, oh, he scored, mm, good. We've got to thank you. I mean, the obvious question, the last one is, I mean, are you done in football? Are we going to see you back in football at some juncture, do you feel? You know, um, in, a, in a way, um, I, I love football and uh, it's, been, it's been always part of my life as a player. Then obviously I've seen it from the other side. And I love coaching, for example. That's one one of the things I I um, I do more and more because I I like to share the experience and think of how to improve, uh, you know, performance, players, teams. And I would not be I know per, to be perfectly honest, I I would love to coach the team more than like being a goalkeeper coach. You know, it's by more intrigued by like coaching the team. Like you, you are there on the pitch and then you work with more players and obviously you can still go with the goalkeepers, but then you will always do it. But, uh, but I enjoy that as well. And so we will see. And I think I always say like, it has to be, a, I'm, I'm a little bit spoiled now. Yeah. So right. I, I had 20 years of the career with literally five days off, I jump into 24-7 job. Now um, I've been at home, do obviously being busy doing other stuff, but having more time. You know, spend with the, with the family. The, the, I do my the doctorate. I do other things, working like with other people, helping the Czech FA and some coaching and all these things. So you just go like, um, okay, I, I like that. So if I have to go back to do 24-7, it has to really be something which will make sense in a way. Yeah. So I'm, you know, it's been in an arrogant way, it will have to sit perfectly for what I want to do because, because I, I feel like that that would be me. That would be me investing 100%. And, and then obviously that's the part of um, where I'm looking and thinking, well, if something like that comes where I will really feel is the right thing to do, I will. If if I don't, then I carry on doing what I'm doing. I mean, my last question, I mean, we obviously, we all know who the, that's my last, obviously we all know who the boss is. She, she makes the decision, doesn't she, at the <laughs> club? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, when you worked with her, uh, when you worked, when you became the 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 Technical yeah, advisor. technical advisor for the club. Did you work directly with her? Though, although she, I felt that she 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 had the final say when it comes to who comes in and who goes because she has that she had that power. You know, she was she was that powerful. Um, so I mean, you worked very closely with her. How do you how did you see that? What was she the was she the the the, the kind of boss that said, okay, I am Marina, I am the boss. Yeah. This is it. This player is coming. Or this manager goes. Uh, she has a, a conversation with Roman, and then the, the, the then the manager goes. Is that something, or does she consult you, or does she speak to other people? Well, I think you are right. There is one. There, there, there is a one boss. There was a one <laughs> boss, and, and obviously, and then you have the big boss. Yeah. So obviously, then that's the that's the one you you know you respect, uh, and so that everybody respects. Of course. And of course, yeah. uh, of course, my boss was Marina, and so I had to work the way that we we do the most uh, things the the best possible way. So my, as I said, my um, my aim was for the football side to be as best as possible in terms of the the work efficiency people working together and and having the clear idea of what we want to do and obviously the my my boss was either allowing me to, to do it not allowing to do it or or i had to adjust to to what was set as a, as the vision and the clear idea of of the club so you have to always defend the club 
but then you have to defend you know your your side of, of football and 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 i think the brilliant part was that um we, we felt it as as the players and we felt it i felt it in working with uh, with marina was that football was really the priority yeah like of course you need to like the financial fair play there is no messing around you either can, you can. You have to stay on the right, correct mm -hmm. side of it. Mm -hmm. So they, they would never, would never, never. Nobody would ever put that in any danger or put the club in any danger. Mm. But you have, you have things where you, you tr like, you can either choose to be doing more commercials, the players more involved in in commercial side, mm -hmm. marketing, revenues, and all this. Or you try to make sure that you do enough what you need, but you make sure it does not affect the players on the pitch. Yeah, that right. they don't feel like their job is more acting than uh, and doing acting, yeah. and yeah. shooting yeah. commercials than actually training, Wait, preparing, and doing it. So we always we always made sure that no matter how the preseason was structured in terms of what you have to do towards the partners and you have to do you can't just be blind and think that they don't need to when they they don't need you they don't need the players they don't need their respect they don't need the money of course they need so but you can choose the day when is the most convenient when actually is best to do it when you speak to the coach you speak to everybody and you say well okay on this day it's fine. It's it's well that it doesn't affect the performance, and I think we try to do that this way. That was that was probably the best uh, the, the best I've seen uh, like um, to do when when I was at Arsenal. It was really well organized as well, and I I, I like that because there was a, like a designated day for for the commercial stuff, and you had two three hours where you just knew okay this afternoon. It goes out of the way, and then for three weeks you you don't have to worry about that, and you just go along with football. I re that was well organized too, so you know that experience helps as well when you when you see different approaches. But but we always made sure that it never affected the the, prepar the preparation and the performance that people felt like okay, we do our job, we prepared, we confident that we win the next game. Yeah, amazing, absolutely. Amazing. Well, listen, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. I mean, we've kept you two hours. Yep. It's yep. been genuinely enlightening. <laughs> it's been awesome, Peter. Cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much, uh, Pete. Yeah, good luck with it all. Good luck. I'm looking forward to seeing if you're back in football. Uh, obviously, enjoy the ice hockey. Enjoy. You're doing so much. You're doing your masters and all other things, Peter. So, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm thank you, Pete. Thank you. Pet, what a legend. Cheers. Top Thank you so Petter. much. Thank you. <laughs> Petter check. What a guy. That was awesome. That was great, Peter. Thank you, buddy. Winning has always been my driving force. Growing up, I dreamt of playing for the Nigerian national team. My passion led me there. The support and unity of players and Nigerian fans led us to the final. Together, we won the African Cup of Nations. A moment that will forever be carved in my heart. Join the winning team with Bet Winner.